What began as a violent confrontation ended silently in the back of a police car. The last hour of Keith Muriel's life playing out on body camera footage. Tonight, we're going back to that New Year's Eve encounter to see when those officers' actions became something criminal and violated policies. All of it seen through the officers' body cameras, a silent witness in this case. And a reminder, this video may be disturbing for many of you. Well, one arm shoots your ass. Don't say nothing. Hey, we didn't tell you to stop walking. Let's go, boss. The last minute had already been frustrating for Officer Kenya McCarty. If you don't leave, you're going to be arrested for trespass. Repeatedly, she tells Keith Muriel to leave the extended stay hotel property on Beasley Road, but he tries to walk back again. I said go. And again. I want you in the street. Let's go. When Muriel leaves, McCarty vents to the security guard and Avery Willis, her fellow officer. I'm sorry. I I can't be disrespected like that that many times, and he's just standing there. Five minutes later, Muriel comes back. Immediately, Willis tackles the six foot three man and starts telling him to put his hands behind his back. Within seconds, one officer starts using their taser against Muriel in what's called drive stun mode, used by police to force someone to comply, but it's not working. By the time Officer James Land arrives, Muriel has already been stunned at least 35 times. Fix it. Come on, fix it. it takes them another 12 minutes to get Muriel into the patrol car, stuffing the man inside on his stomach. Body camera footage shows nobody actually opened the door to check on the suspect until AMR arrived nearly an hour later. Is it I don't think so. The three officers take turns performing chest compressions for several minutes, but Muriel never regains consciousness. He's pronounced dead before the night ends. If you don't watch the video and you listen to the officers, they're narrating an entirely different scene than is happening in front of your eyes. We shared the entire body camera breakdown with University of Nevada law professor Addie Rolnick. The narration seems to be designed uh, to make it sound like it's defensible to use certain levels of force and to respond in certain ways. But when you're watching the video, none of what they're talking about seems to be happening. From the way the officers were narrating, okay. it sounded as if they were dealing with someone who was sort of at the active aggression level. So they kept saying things like, stop kicking me. Active aggression is defined in JPD's use of force policy as essentially fighting the officer. Professor Rolnick says it looks like Muriel's behavior, though, doesn't rise past the level of what's called defensive resistance, where he may not give his hand to them to be handcuffed, but he's not trying to hit them. Three on your side combed through hundreds of pages of JPD's general orders, looking for other possible violations, too. Like the department's taser policy, it requires officers to notify their supervisor once they've used it. McCarty told dispatch about the taser use 13 minutes after the first discharge, but did so only after a bystander called 911 and told dispatch what the officers were doing. There's a citizen on the phone saying that you've tased that person out there about four times and he hasn't heard anybody ask for AMR. The conversation with the dispatcher then continues privately, never transmitted to the public, but captured on body camera. He's fighting all units out here while he's in the cuffs, possibly high off PC or something. He's in the MR call to what? He was Go ahead and roll the dispatch. We was trying to get him in the PC. JPD's taser policy also says anyone exposed to taser activation should be monitored regularly while in custody, and officers should use a restraint technique that does not impair respiration. For most of the ordeal, body camera footage shows Muriel on his stomach. An officer placed him on his stomach again when he was inside the patrol car and triple handcuffed. The department's taser policy points out that any person getting more than three standard five-second cycles from the taser shall be transported to a medical facility. Regardless, you're still sending electricity through somebody's body. And that's still a, a while it's a less than lethal deployment, um, it is still an aggressive deployment uh, that needs to be taken into account of how many times, where, who, uh, and if it's not working, we need to do something else. AMR would not arrive until 58 minutes after dispatch notified them. While the delay in ambulance service isn't the officer's fault, JPD's use of force policy requires those officers to render or request medical aid as soon as reasonably possible. Yet they chose not to open the door and check on Muriel while they waited. Attorneys argue some of that is the supervisor's fault, too, in a federal civil case. It alleges Sergeant Casanova Reed is liable for his officer's failure to render medical aid. Sarge, I promise you we ain't had no choice. Go look at him. 
But Reed never did. The body camera footage shows Reed never checked on Muriel or asked his subordinates to do so either. He arrived after they placed the suspect in the patrol car. Once he was there, he now became responsible for what was going on and any actions taken there afterwards or maybe inactions that were taking there afterwards. Reed had recently been promoted to sergeant six months prior. Though Reed had been told his officers used a taser on Muriel, he didn't make sure that policy was enforced, where someone who's been tased has to be monitored and cannot be in a restraint position that affects their breathing. And that is part of his job, according to those JPD general orders. Still, Reed won't likely be charged criminally, according to law enforcement expert Adam Coffrin. He wasn't there for any of the use of force. He wasn't there to stop it or change it. He was really coming in after the fact. And so uh, the culpability for you know a criminal charging section after the fact, uh, as the DA uh, has probably shown, that isn't necessarily there. McCarty and Willis are indicted on a depraved heart murder charge, land with manslaughter. When did their actions become criminal? Rolnick says it starts with the tasing and whether those officers knew how dangerous that could be. So they would argue that they didn't know, but then when you couple that with the complete indifference to the possibility that he might be injured um, or might need care and the kind of callous talking about it, it then starts to look um, a lot more like depraved heart murder. Essentially, if they had gotten him medical assistance quickly and effectively, she says, it would be much harder to argue murder in this case. But Rolnick says the issues with the officer's approach starts even before that first instance of violence from Willis when he tackled Muriel to the ground, unprovoked. He's not even arguing, um, and he's certainly never doing anything that even could, I think, be construed as a threat. So, like, the only thing that they have to argue that he was threatening is that he was there and he was large, and, and they don't say it, but large and black. There's no behavior to suggest that he's posing any danger. So it's sort of, it's this idea that he needs to be taken down. C.J. LeMaster, three on your side.